Great. So I will have a chat kind of visible here. So it will be in my face. If someone chats on the Zoom. And uh, let's first talk about the course uh, submission system. So if you go to the to the course wiki, then there is a link uh, at the top. Uh, and this is the those of you who are doing the cloud computing course. It's the same uh, the same mechanics. So we have built like students have built like a submission system and peer review system that we use, uh, and that system allows um, to collect submissions for assignments, and it also allows a peer review of those submissions. So we can create forms for submission and for review, and then students can use those forms to submit the work and then um, review the work. So we will use it for our assignments. We will not use it for all the assignments. So for example, we are not gonna use it for assignment Golang 1 uh, because Golang 1 was sort of a very simple uh, warm up uh, exercise. So uh, I will kind of evaluate it uh, myself with the teaching stuff, um, but we will use it for Golang 2 and for Haskell assignments and for the other ones. So with the exception of Golang 1, we will, we will use it uh, for all the other assignments, um, all the other compulsory assignments, uh, but we will not use it for non-compulsory assignments uh, because non-compulsory assignments don't have to be submitted by everybody, right? So we will have it for Golang 2, Haskell 1, and Haskell 2. Uh, no, Haskell 2 is not compulsory. Um, but we will have it, I, I think, for Haskell 2 as well. Um, so I already opened it for Haskell 1. So if you go to this link, you can, um, you can submit your Haskell 1 assignment. And the deadline is uh, on Saturday. And then after that, there is um, over a week for reviews. Uh, and the deal is that uh, everyone should do at least two reviews. Uh, if you do more, that's fine. That will count as a bonus. But if you do less, then that's um, considered uh, free writing, right? So it's not too good. Uh, you're not gonna get punished, uh, but we, we sort of expect uh, everybody to do at least two reviews. Um, otherwise the system sort of doesn't work. Uh, so what it means is you will have to check Two other submissions and see how they've done things and whether they've completed the the tasks um it's pretty straightforward so you will see if you are if you're doing it for haskell one uh you will see that it's uh pretty pretty trivial um yeah now that i think about it uh because haskell 2 is not compulsory not all everybody will do it uh then maybe i will kind of uh do the submission and review for golang one as well uh, even though it, it was quite simple like a haskell one is also quite simple um uh let me think about it i i will i will kind of think about it May, maybe it's um maybe it's okay to open submissions and peer review for non-compulsory tasks as well uh and only people who are doing them can um can do the reviews uh i don't know i i will think a, a little bit about it yep Um, tic tac roll is not mandatory. Yeah, so the only mandatory is Haskell one. Uh, the the idea was that last year we had we didn't have mandatory tasks, and students were panicking that they're gonna fail the course uh, because the has the tic tac roll, for example, is quite hard. Um, so I, first of all, I've made the compulsory task such that you can easily do them, like they are quite simple. Uh, and that means you will pass, right? So the, if, if, like if someone does the compulsory tasks, they will pass. It's a low, low pass, like, you know, D, but it's a pass, uh, even if you don't do the, the other ones. Uh, so that's the idea behind the compulsory tasks that the, the students who struggle to do like uh, task two or tic tac roll, then can like co concentrate on those and then like pass like the, the portfolio, right? 
Uh, I, I mean, it's not a pass over portfolio because you still need to have the individual project, right? If you only do the compulsory tasks, you will not pass actually the portfolio because you have to have the individual project as well. Um, the individual project is compulsory too. Um, but I will grade the portfolio, right? So those students who have compulsory tasks, they will be included into grading and those who don't, they will not be graded at all. They, they just get F for the portfolio. Uh, and then the additional ones like the Haskell 2 and, and Tic Tac role, those are for better students who wants to have a better grade and they are not compulsory, but of course I encourage everybody to do that, right? Yeah, but I, I think it's okay if we do use a submission system for those, like we did that last year anyway, because some students didn't do all the tasks and we have used the submission system for all the tasks. So yeah, that will probably work fine. So those two are not compulsory. Um, Right, so um, check the submission system. Uh, as I said, it's already open for Haskell one. Uh, I will I will add it. So I I will think about it. Like, do we do it for GoLang one or not? Uh, but definitely we're gonna do it for GoLang two, because GoLang two was quite interesting and it's kind of good for people to see how they kind of did certain things. Uh, so I will uh, definitely do it. We will do the peer review for Golang 2. And then I, I think it's, it's good to see Haskell 2 and um, Tic Tac Roll also, because especially for Tic Tac Roll, you can have a really different approaches and that's good to see how other people did it, right? Um, and if, if, um, if we do the peer review, then I can discuss it in the class as well afterwards. So I will, I will do it for the other ones as well. I don't want to overburden you. Like, of course, doing a peer review is also kind of a, a little bit time consuming because you have to check somebody else's code. So maybe I will only do it for, for those four and we will skip uh, Golang one. All right, so that's one uh, organizational issue. The other organizational issue is that it's quite a lot of us. And I hope everybody will do the individual project. And that means we cannot really present the project because, um, you know, even doing a five minute pitch for like 50 projects, that's going to take ages, right? So we're not going to do this. We will not have a presentations in the class. We will not be pitching it. Um, instead, what you will do is you will kind of record a video um, and then you will kind of, uh, in the video, you will talk about your project and you will kind of do a code walk, walk, walk through. Um, we've used that form last year for a game programming course last semester. And students, um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say the students loved it. It was quite neutral, right? So they didn't hate it, but they didn't love it neither. But for the markers, that was great because instead of kind of only going through the code and kind of uh, guessing what the students were thinking, you were kind of having a video and you can kind of see what they were thinking and how they kind of approach certain things or why they've done certain things certain way. And that was much beneficial for grading. Like you can sort of um, see sometimes kind of good insights. And even if they done something wrong, you can have an explanation or you can have some insights. And I really loved it, right? So I think uh, you will see more of that. Uh, you will see more of the lecturers trying to get you to talk about your work or about your portfolio. And I think that's, um, that's a good mechanism. So instead of preparing presentation for the class, uh, you will just kind of uh, record a video. You don't have to be on the video. You can use like a screencast and you can use some slides. Uh, and for code walkthrough, you, of course, you can just use a code editor and sort of show some, some bits. You don't have to show all the code. You just need to show the code that you want to show. Uh, so maybe you want to show um, some parts of the code that you're proud of, that you really spend a lot of time on. Um, <clears throat> and it, we also want you to be able to judge um, when you've done something wrong, right? So you can also focus on the stuff that you didn't do well. And it's not, it, it's not bad, right? So if you, if you show a code and you say, I'm, I'm not really proud of this code, it's like, you know, a little bit of a spaghetti code, like I should have refactored it, but I didn't. But if you say that, that actually works in your favor because that means you kind of are aware of some things that you've done that you could improve. Um, 
instead of us just watching the code and seeing like a mess and saying, oh yeah, that's a mess, right? So that's kind of bad, right? So a bad code, which is like reflected on actually works in your favor. So I'm not saying you should have bad code in your projects just to reflect on them and have kind of a positive points for it. Uh, but in case you didn't manage to kind of refactor everything, um, then you can talk about the code that you are kind of happy with, but also code that you haven't refactored yet and it's on your to-do list. So you say that part or that module, I am not, I haven't refactored yet. And there are some things I can improve. And if you can identify what those things are, then that works in your favor as well, right? So don't keep it very long, uh, you know, maximum 10 minutes. Um, and um, we can talk more about it in the, like towards the end of the course. Um, and then you will resubmit the URLs for your, for your projects. And you will also have to prepare a short, um, uh, a short reflections on your submissions, right? So this video is only for your project. And then for your actual assignments, you do it in text. So you, you kind of prepare a short readme file uh, attached to, um, to, the, um, to the submissions. And then we sort of use that. Uh, I didn't decide it if, if it's just a readme file in your repo. Um, or if it is like an Inspera text box that um, uh, that you fill in. Um, because we don't have to use external graders, like we will have um, myself and an external grader, which is not related to the course, but not outside and TNU. Um, we like, he can get, I know the, the, the person and he can read the Git repos perfectly fine. So he can find the, the readme files. So maybe this will be just a URL to a readme file, like URLs to a readme files in the project. Uh, so you will not need to copy and paste things into Inspera um, just to make it simple. And then the examination office uh, assigned the deadline and the deadline for submission portfolio is 20th of May, um, which is quite after the, the semester finishes actually, because the semester finishes like the uh, early May, I, I think. Uh, so you will have actually a couple of weeks to work on your portfolio beyond the course. Uh, and you can spend this time to kind of um, fine tune your project, but I encourage you not to leave all your project work, you know, until, until after the semester, because then, you know, that's not, um, enough time. You should do a little bit of work throughout the semester and then you can do a little bit more uh, after. And then the exam, I think the exam is, <clears throat> let me see. Um, so I will, yeah, just give me a second. So exam, Yeah, so MAPE is uh, 20th of, of May. It will open on 18th. And then the actual exam is on the 2nd of, um, 2nd of June. Um, right, so uh, with the past exams, uh, the, uh, the past exams are embargoed. So they are not visible to, to students, but what we do is um, in one of the last lectures, I talk about the exam, how the questions are, and I give you examples of the questions that uh, could be on the exam, but they are not in the exam, right? So I kind of don't show you the past exam. Uh, well, you can guess, like we sometimes reuse the questions, right? So we have a certain pool of questions, and then every time, if we re release the exam, then after a while we used up the pool and we would have to make up new questions, right? And that means um, that that has a side effect that if you have good questions, you cannot ask them anymore because they, you have used them and you have to come up with new questions, which means the exam kind of de facto becomes sort of harder because you have more and more obscure questions which you haven't used in the past, right? So that, that is sort of an undesirable effect. So instead what we do is I have a kind of a, uh, example questions that I show, and then we kind of have the pool of questions that we reuse. We don't reuse all the questions, of course, but we do reuse some of the questions. And then, uh, 
So that's one, one reason. The other reason is uh, creating an exam is actually quite a hard work. So first of all, you have to come up with questions, right? Uh, once you come up with questions, you don't know if those questions are good. So for example, um, we have questions where um, nobody gets right, right? You have a question where nobody answered correctly, right? Or 100% of students answered correctly, right? Those are kind of bad questions. So you have to remove them from the exam because they don't actually give you anything, right? If everybody answers correctly or nobody answers correctly, then like, what's the point of having a question like that, right? But you don't know that like, it, it, it looks to you that it's a good question, but then it turns out it's a bad question, right? Um, sometimes we have questions which are kind of easy and we think they are kind of hard or uh, vice versa. So we want to balance the exam in such a way that majority of the questions are actually uh, relatively easy. And then there are some harder questions, but before you run the exam, you think this question is hard, but it turns out like 90% of students got it right, right? That means that's not a hard question. Uh, and then you have some questions which like I thought were easy, but only like 30% of students got right. That means that's a hard question, right? So you have to re rebalance them. So it takes actually a few years, right? So like to prepare an exam, it takes at least like two years of running the exam to kind of uh, get a good set of questions kind of organized correctly and having to know what questions are sort of what. Um, so that's why we don't, we, we kind of embargo the questions and we don't release them Otherwise, the quality of the exam would actually go down uh, because we would have to play in the dark every year by coming up with kind of a set of new questions. Um, and that's kind of not desirable. So that's, that's one reason. The other reason is uh, the last two years, of course, we have to do a home, home exam. And home exams are different to school exams because you can access everything, right? So uh, you can basically Google everything and you can, um, kind of use any sort of help uh, when you're working at home. And when you're working at school, uh, we can limit certain things that you cannot like uh, look up things on the internet, right? So then the set of questions has to be changed too, because for home exam, having sort of a lookup questions, which are kind of Googleable, that, that doesn't make much sense neither, right? Uh, so like some of the recall questions, uh, we have to remove and we have to replace them with like uh, reflection questions such that you tell us what you think, not what the internet thinks, right? Uh, <clears throat> so it's complicated. But we will talk about the exam in the last uh, class and then I will explain exactly how the exam will work and what sort of questions you can expect. Any other questions about the assessment and the submission system? Right, so as I said, if you focus on compulsory tasks and the, port, uh, the project, then you will pass, but you will pass very low grade. Uh, if you want to have a better grade, you have to do non-compulsory tasks and you have to contribute to the course uh, somehow. So you have to go a little bit beyond sort of what, um, what the minimum is. And to do that, we have kind of a bonus, bonus uh, task, like the uh, go lang zero to bonus. Uh, we have the Tic Tac Roll and Haskell too. Uh, and last year we did, um, we used in the class kind of a, a student's um, example, which I have used to explain some of the concepts. And then I told students that you can re-implement it. Uh, so I will kind of do this uh, with you. Um, and then you can, again, same as with uh, Golang to bonus, you can re-implement it with another programming language uh, of your favorite pro programming language. And then we can measure the performance and we can measure uh, certain metrics, like how uh, the algorithm works in that particular language compared to, the, to Haskell. Um, <clears throat> there is a question. So, <clears throat> You cannot, like the question is how the submission system will work if you miss deadline. Uh, you cannot miss deadline. So those are hard deadlines. And if you miss deadline, then you're not graded. You, you, your assignment is not counted. Um, so the, the deadlines are kind of finite and you cannot miss it. So 
for February for the Saturday deadline. If you're not ready with Haskell one and you miss it, then you miss the assignment. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, very good question. So, very good question. So, we have uh, two extra tasks. We have the Golang bonus and students, which don't have a deadline uh, because um, they involve other programming languages that we don't really need to discuss uh, extensively in the class. Uh, whereas the Haskell tool and Tic Tac role are sort of, um, it's good to have a deadline such that I can discuss the, the, the code and I can discuss the projects in the class during the semester, such that those people who do, did them kind of get some feedback and kind of formative feedback. And those students who didn't do them kind of learn something new, right? So that's why we do have uh, <clears throat> deadlines for those two, such that after the deadline, I can show you how I would do them and how different students did them and we can kind of discuss it. If we didn't have a deadline, that means I would never be able to talk about it until the, after the semester when the submission of the portfolio is, right? I am flexible, so I can actually, as, as I said, I don't need to talk with you about Golang 2 and the students, like if you re-implemented in C or you re-implemented in C++. Sorry, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. but let, let, let me finish. So I don't care about those two um, and I don't need to talk about them, right? So we, we will not have deadline for those two. For these two, uh, I am flexible. We can move the deadline. So we can move the deadline until like certain time, but in the semester, such that I can still talk about it, right? So we have the benefits um, of me discussing it and like uh, showing you how I've done it. And, you know, we all learn from each other, right? So those two deadlines, um, like if you want to move them, I, I mean, I, in fact, I don't care about those deadlines, right? We could have it like same as with the Golang 2 and students that there is no deadline. You just, uh, we just, wait until uh, 20th of May, right? But I think it's beneficial for us to talk about those two uh, and kind of talk about like, because when there is a submission, you will have to submit it and then people can review it and then you get feedback. If we wait until end of semester, then you will not get any feedback, right? So um, if you want to change those two dates, uh, just make an issue in the issue tracker and if majority of people are happy, I'm happy, like it's up to you. Um, the, the only co like request or constraint I have is that I would prefer having a deadline before the end of the semester, such at least I have one lecture to talk about it, right? Or maybe two, two lectures. Um, one lecture for Haskell 2 and one lecture for Tic Tac Roll, right? Um, last, like Haskell 2 is not that, that um, creative. Like you can do certain things certain way, but it's not super creative. This one is more, more creative. Like last year, we had uh, students doing <clears throat> different things, and it was kind of interesting to talk about it, like how, why you did it a certain way, right? Yeah. So uh, please make a new, like, new issue in the issue tracker for those two deadlines, and then I'm happy to move it um, like later towards the end of the semester, as long as we get some time to discuss it, right? Yeah, so Golang bonus will not be delivered in the submission system. It will be delivered in Inspira only. So Sander says, can we get one extra week for both of them? I'm fine. So make an issue and then uh, people can uh, express their opinion and we can move it. Like I'm very flexible. Like you decide. You decide what two deadlines for those two you would like to have. Um, th those deadlines are for you. And then just to discuss it afterwards. Uh, so I'm. I, I will leave it to you to decide what dates you would like to have for those two. Um, for Golang to bonus and for um, students, um, we don't have a deadline, although it might also be beneficial to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, the implementations. Um, so, 
I don't know how to do this. Um, so for example, uh, we had, uh, because we did, uh, we did the, the Haskell, uh, the, the students um, task last semester as well. Uh, and the interesting thing was, that one of the students implemented uh, the, the students in C++ and it was the slowest out of all the implementation. It was like twice as slow as Python, <laughs> okay? And that was interesting because if you do C++ in a very naive way, just doing C++ doesn't mean it will be the fastest, right? Uh, he did it in a kind of a naive way and he was kind of allocating uh, vectors multiple times unnecessary and that meant the implementation was actually damn slow. It was slower than Python, right? Um, so then we had to refactor it and we had to kind of uh, look into the code and it was actually a good, um, good learning exercise. So what we could do is we could, um, we could wait until like the very last week and then I can kind of talk about it a little bit more uh, in the class as well. But then we kind of freeze the, um, the Git repositories such that you cannot kind of commit after a, like we will effectively have a deadline for the for Golang to bonus and for students. Um, because that, as I'm saying, like if we do have a kind of a cutoff date, it allows us to, to talk about it and it allows us for me to talk about like what not to do and what to do to, to get certain effects. Um, but as I'm saying, like I'm flexible. So make an issue in the issue tracker and we can uh, agree on like how to do this. As it is now, I am happy to move those two dates and the uh, Golang uh, 2 and students are not, they don't have a deadline. So you can kind of do stuff until the, uh, the submission, which is 20th of May. But if you want us to spend some time and to review and to kind of talk about those various implementations, then we would need to, for the students and for the Golang to move it. So maybe we move one of them and we leave the other one open. The project, yes, the projects are until May, 20 of May, that, that will not change. I don't want this to change, right? So I don't want to have another deadline for projects. All right, uh, more or less clear, some options. So you, you can decide, like um, I'm, I'm flexible. All right, so let's, <clears throat> Let's have a look at the students thing. So um, students is a simple, um, we often when we're doing some um, programs, especially like if, if you're doing some cloud uh, system uh, where a user input is uh, required or where you're creating something, you need to do validation. So every time you have like a form, online form, uh, which a user submit some data, uh, then you need to do sort of a form validation or error checking. Um, so to simulate this, um, we have kind of a design of a very simple system where you asking a user to create students into sort of a local memory store um, and the students data has to be validated. So students have name, surname and age. So that's kind of like a very trivial uh, record, a very trivial like data structure. So each student has kind of, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, three properties. And then there are certain constraints. So a name must be a single string that starts with a capital letter. Um, so it can contains the ASCII letters uh, and, and it has to be at least two characters, right? So, um, a name cannot be shorter than two characters, has to start with capital letter and can only contain letters. So no digits uh, and so on. And then for the surname is the same, the same constraints, but the length requirement is four, right? And then the age is a natural number, like a um, integral number. And then it has to be between 18 and 130, right? So. The, the system sort of works like this, that I, I kind of run it. And then I say, add student. And then I say what the name is. So if I say Mariusz um, Nowostowski, and then I say uh, H. So if I say 12, that's illegal, right? Because H cannot be 
uh, less than 18. If I say 19, that's legal. If I say something which is not a number, that's illegal. And then if this one is two, char two characters, that's illegal because it's too short. If this one is one character, that's illegal because it's too short. So this one is legal now, but this one is illegal. So you can have errors in multiple places. You can have errors in one place, or you can have it valid, right? So if I have uh, error here because it's a small letter, and I have error here because it's too short, and I have error here because it's too large, because it's more than 130, then you have multiple ways of dealing with the um, with the errors, right? So a simple case is we um, detect that there is an error and we just kind of say, yeah, there was an error and we're returning an empty student, right? So we don't know what like exactly what went wrong, but we know there is some illegal values being passed and um, we kind of ignore the errors and we say, yeah, I mean, you get nothing in return. You get an empty student, right? <coughs> so then, so that's case A. Case B is you have a simple validation where you kind of are processing the data and the very first error you get, you stop. So you say, okay, I, I, I don't check any further because you already have something wrong and that's what is wrong, right? So you return the first error uh, and again, you return an empty student, but you, together with this empty student, you say, you know, that's the first error. Like uh, in this case, uh, name is to, it doesn't start with capital letter, right? That's the first error. You can have first error, which is double error, right? So you, you have the, the name being not starting with the capital letter and being too short. Like there are two, two errors already here, but you only need to report one, right? So you could say, yeah, this one is too short and that's it. Um, and then if, um, if I fix the too short, then you say, yeah, now this one is not too short, but it's like, doesn't have a capital letter, right? But you only need to report one error. So that's case B. And then, well, you have, um, you have case C, which is the, the most advanced one where you want to report all the errors, right? So you want to uh, return an empty student if there are errors plus a list of all the errors that are wrong. So in this case, there are like uh, three errors. Like this one doesn't start with capital letter. This one is too short and this one is too big. So there are three, three errors. For this one, there are four errors because this one is too short and doesn't start with capital letter, right? So uh, that's case, case C. And then um, uh, the question is um, what and when should we deal with exceptions, right? So should we use exceptions? And when should we use the exceptions? Um, so for some programming languages, um, you, you would have that. Uh, for some, you wouldn't, um, and then you can use panics. Um, so you can also have um, certain um, situations where you want to, where you want to panic. In this, in this particular case, you can sort of do up to C because you don't really need to deal with those, and you can hide. Um, so, like, you know. Uh, Let's talk about this one. So the constraint is then that should be a number and the number should be between 18 and 130. So that's the constraint. And if the constraint is broken, then you return the error. But what happens if I put, um, if I put text here, right? Uh, that's not a number, right? Should you return an error or should you have an exception or should you panic, right? So uh, if I, put a, a, a number here and the number is wrong, that's an error, of, of course. But if the number is not a number, should you throw an exception or should you uh, deal with that, right? Because normally what we do is we take this string and we need to parse it into the integer. And of course, the parsing into the integer of that string will panic, like it will throw out um, kind of a, an exception or error, depending what programming language you use. 
Uh, so then should you propagate this to the user or should you kind of wrap it up into an error and return an error? So it's kind of your decision, right? So that's the difference between dealing only up to C and returning only errors or doing kind of a DME case, for example, when the last thing is not really a, a number, right? Because the parsing, you, you're not doing the parsing, you're delegating the parsing into the system call and the system call will, you know, if you're using Java, it will throw you an exception. If you're using um, uh, other programming language, it can yeah, either panic or kind of uh, give you an error, right? In Golang, you will get an error, right? It, the Golang will not panic, it will kind of give you an error. Uh, and then you can wrap it up and return the error to the user. Um, so depending on what programming language you use, you could kind of consider DNA. Um, then, then you don't do it, yeah. Yeah, so the maximum point was C, right? Uh, so because we, um, uh, what we did at the end of the day, we used the, the version C and we had correct, uh, like, um, not, not, not correct, but like data that was not kind of invalid in a sense of throwing IO or kind of a, like we didn't have cases like this, right? But we have cases like this. So we had kind of half of the data set correct and half of the set incorrect, but incorrect in an er error, error way, like the C way. And then we measured the performance of different implementations, right? Uh, so the, the baseline is C. So uh, to get the maximum, you kind of need to do C, right? To return all the errors as errors. Um, and then if you're using D or E, we didn't actually check it, but it's uh, like up to you, but... Um, what we will kind of measure for performances uh, is C, yeah. So um, talking about D and E, like, you know, um, if, you, if the errors are user errors, then usually that should be just an error because it should be recoverable, right? Uh, but if there are some external errors like, you know, IO or um, some resources or, or sometimes even, even uh, parsing, Okay, you know, the question is, can you recover? If you can recover, then it should be an error. If you cannot recover, yes, that then probably it has to be a panic or something, right? Um, also, the question is, if you cannot recover, um, why you cannot recover? Because of the data you got from the user or because of sort of things that are beyond your control? Um, because every time, um, things are wrong because of the user, like you should be sort of in, the, in, in this category, right? <coughs> and then like this category, well, it happens. Like um, if you cannot, like um, let's say, um, we are reading something from the standard input and the pipe is broken. Like we get an IO exception saying, oh, well, you cannot read from standard input anymore because whatever happened, like, you know, then you have to panic, like there is, it's not recoverable, right? Um, and then you have internal errors, right? So um, those are kind of tricky uh, because um, they usually belong to both of the categories. It's, um, um, yeah, I, I had a, a, an interesting case uh, a couple of days ago. So with the submission system, uh, the submission system uh, was not giving kind of a, 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 a meaningful error messages. So if something went wrong, it says, you know, 500 server error, you know, um, you have to go back to, to your form or whatever. So well, what we did is we added like the um, error messages and then like a, a, a trace dump of where something went wrong such that we can debug it. You, of course, for the production system, you should never do that because you should not show the user like a stack trace of all the calls. But for us, because we're still debugging the system and there are some bugs and so on, it's very useful. So if something happens to you, you will get kind of a stack trace and then um, you can report and then we can fix it. Unfortunately, it's not deployed yet. So the fix is there, but not in the system that you're using. You will only get 500 for, for now. Um, and 
the, the code sort of looked um, a little bit like this. So I have, um, so I had kind of, um, um, uh, a lot of code which had handle error and handle error was taking time, uh, kind of like a request uh, and um, the response, right? So there was a request and the response. And what I did, I sort of uh, pattern matched uh, all the, like the, there were like 250 of those calls. So I said, replace it with handle, uh, sorry, handle error, error and, are like like this, right? So the, the original call was sort of something like this. And then I replaced it with this. And then uh, for most of the time, the, it, like in the body of the method, um, there was some code and the code was dealing with the error, but was not just reporting it. But the, the students who implemented it, they say, okay, if error is like, you know, not nil, then do something. but when they were printing stuff to the user, they were kind of doing like this. So they were ignoring the error. And I kind of uh, rewrote this method to include the error. Um, and for most of the like 250 lines like this, it kind of worked automatically <laughs> because they had this error kind of in scope. So there was like some, some function which had an error defined. And then it sort of was like this. Uh, there were some cases where there was no error so I had to kind of uh, create uh, my own error. And there were like one case where there was an error and the error was nil, right? So the error was nil, but they were checking some length. So they had kind of an if statement, uh, you know, some condition and the condition was broken and they were throwing an error, but the error was nil. And then what happened was when I hit that case, um, I had a panic because the nil, like I, um, this was nil. And then in the handle error, I was like trying to call an error method on it, right? Because uh, I'm sort of doing error, error, right? So when this is nil, that, that panics. And that's kind of like a programming error. Um, and, you know, the, the system would kind of uh, crash um, and I wouldn't get any error at all because the system crashed, so you get black screen. Uh, but it is definitely a programming error, and then you need to kind of find out why the system crashed, and the system crashed because this was nil. And that should never be nil, because this handle error should only be if error is not nil, right? Um, so that was kind of a, uh, really difficult to find out, and also really difficult to, to, to find in the first place that kind of a, um, problem like this will will exist. Okay, anyway, so um, this is a very simple, um, very simple use case. And as I said, um, I will kind of add the spec um, and I will give you the, um, the implementation in Haskell. And the implementation in Haskell is kind of like, uh, basically like you add, uh, I think it's, it's called add student. Uh, and then it's like name, surname, age, uh, and then the validation happens on those the, uh, entries. Um, and it is it, it reads this command and this data from a standard input, right? All right, so let's have a short break. Um, and let's have a break. And in the break, um, think, how would you represent a student type in Haskell? So how would you define student? And we know, well, the student only needs to have um, name, surname, and age.
I drink coffee as well. Drink. I, I don't drink coffee myself, but you do? Yeah, good. Some sugar in the morning, not bad.
Right. So time's up, let's continue. So I've added the actual commands that the program takes. So the program takes just three commands. One is new, which is this name, surname, age, uh, list, which prints all the students and end, which sort of quits. So if I run the program, so I don't have it yet, here, but let's pretend that I have it. So if I run it, so like if I run students, then it will kind of wait in the uh, standard input for my commands. And then if I say end, it will kind of quit back to shell. If I say list, it will print all the students. And then if I say new um, 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 12, then it will say, well, this one is too short, this one is too short, and this one is too small, and then it will not add new student, but if the data is legal, so if the data is legal, then it will add a new student ma, and then if I say list, it will show me one student, right? So we need to have, we need to represent a student inside, um, and how would you do that? So, um, Any suggestions? So I will create, let me sync with the repo. So, oh yeah, that's one extra thing. So uh, there was, so before we do this, um, so I will do stack new students. Actually, let's do this, uh, make the students and the students and stack new Haskell. That will be kind of a stupid name. I will call it students, but I will rename the folder. So now I have a folder students and I will rename it to Haskell. But the project inside Haskell is called students, right? So now we are, uh, we have here, we have a project, we have a new project called students, but it's in the Haskell directory. And then we can have other directories for other programming languages. So I will do the code here, but I just realized uh, there was an interesting question in the issue tracker. Um, so if I go to, <coughs> If I go to the um, repo, um, the question was about the type of the kind of a polymorphic uh, constructs in Haskell. So one of the polymorphic things that you already know is an empty list. So if I ask what is the type of an empty list, Haskell says, well, an empty list is a list of stuff of type A. Uh, but it doesn't say what A is. A is like a type variable. It can be anything, right? And there are no constraints, which means it's a really polymorphic type. So an empty list is like a, uh, a list of anything, right? But the anything can be truly anything because A is completely unconstrained. Um, and that's very powerful. Uh, that, that's a, a very, very powerful construct that we can deal with um, things that have kind of an unconstrained um, type uh, because we can express certain behaviors or certain uh, logic without binding ourselves to a particular type if that is not necessary. And then we can have a, a more powerful way of expressing ourselves. And in other programming languages, you, you're doing it with generics or you're doing with, with metaprogramming with templates, for example, in C++. So C++ templates allow you to express certain logic, certain algorithm or certain behavior without binding you to a particular type. You can kind of parameterize it. Uh, and in Haskell, it, it's done the same way. So if I ask, what is the type of this list? Um, that's also interesting because it says, well, it's a list of stuff of type A, 
but there is a constraint that A needs to be some form of a number, right? And this is because one is a polymorphic literal. Um, so in many programming languages, one, so if I say, what is one? Uh, it says, well, it, it, it's some type, it's some type P, uh, but we know the meta class of the type is number, right? Um, because the literal one is actually polymorphic in, in Haskell. It can be a float, it can be an integer, and it can be integral, it can be anything. Uh, and it, it you know, depends on the case. And in most cases, you don't care what it is because you only care that the number. Because for example, uh, if I say one plus one, uh, again, you see that the result of this is a number. Like, I don't know if it's an integer, I don't know if it's a float and I don't care, right? Because the plus kind of does the, the same thing, no matter how I interpret one in this particular instance. Uh, that's not the case with Golang, for example, because in Golang, one is of a specific type. It's, it's not polymorphic. Uh, so how about a type of one dot one? Well, again, it says it is some form of type. It doesn't tell me exactly what type it is, but at least we know it's a fractional, right? It's a fraction uh, because I have this decimal point. So it's not integral, but it's fractional. So 1.1 1 .1 is not a generic instance of any number. It's only an instance of fractional numbers, right? So we have kind of a hierarchy of types and we can be more and more generic or we can be more and more specific. Right, um, but I can say, I really want it to be a float. And then it says, yeah, actually one dot one is a float. <laughs> if I force it to be a float, right? So this dot dot notation and the type allows you to coerce or kind of uh, disambiguate a particular broader type of um, polymorphic types into a very specific type. And I can say, I want you to treat one dot one as a float, not as a fractional and blah, 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 but concretely as this concrete type, right? And then if, if I ask what is a float, uh, you will see that a float is a type, right? It, it's not a type class. It, it's sort of a, 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 a primitive type that um, you can express uh, certain things in. And the float is an instance of certain type classes. In particular, it's an instance of fractional numbers. It is an instance of numbers, of course, fractional numbers and floating numbers, right? Um, and all, it's also an instance of real floats and real float and real fractional, right? So as you can see, we have a certain hierarchy of um, type classes and the float is an instance of those. We can ask for int. And an int, it's, the list is a little bit shorter uh, because an int is an instance of a number, of a real number <coughs> and integral number, right? And then we have some additional type classes like equality, uh, which uh, allows you to compare for equality between different entities uh, or which allows you to order uh, things of the particular type in sequence. So this one has a greater than or less than kind of an operator. Uh, you have enumeration uh, and show allows you to convert it to a string um, and so on. So you can kind of browse this. But what I want to talk about is those polymorphic types. So one of them is a polymorphic type is an empty list. Um, do you know any other? Kind of a polymorphic um, polymorphic types in 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 Haskell. Yeah, yes, of course you know the um, the numbers and so on. So we cover that. But apart from that, so do you know the maybe type? Um, So a maybe type is defined as um, a type that is either nothing, sorry, 
It's either nothing or just something, right? So if I, why, why we do this? Why, why we have this type? Um, if, if you go back to C or C++, um, so if I, um, yeah, we can do it here. So let's say, So let's say we are in C++ and uh, or C. Yeah, uh, be before we do this. So the, the issue was that um, somebody was kind of like calling a function and then uh, this should be, was trying to work out how to show uh, the content of this uh, polymorphic type, and it was not able to work out what that polymorphic type is. Um, so you basically need to kind of coerce what an empty list do you mean, such that the type is kind of disambiguated. Um, in many cases, the type is disambiguated because you already initialized it something to a particular type and so on. But if you're calling something with an empty list, and your definition is uh, kind of a generic and the type is polymorphic, then uh, in some situations, uh, the system needs to know what is the exact type of this. Because for example, in this particular case, it was trying to work out if the show is implemented or not. Um, and then you do need to disambiguate it and you're kind of doing it with this uh, double um, column notation and the type. So I sort of disambiguated it to an int like a list of ints, but it's arbitrary, right? So I say, this is an empty list of ints. It can be any empty list of anything, right? But you do need to say, what is that empty list of? Uh, and then this is um, disambiguated. And because ints have a, a show uh, implemented, then should be as happy because it can sort of uh, print certain stuff out. Otherwise, if I use uh, a list of certain things that show is not implemented for, uh, like for example, functions, I could say, uh, this is uh, a list of uh, functions which take A and return an A, uh, right? And then, uh, and then uh, the, then uh, should be would not work because for, um, a function show is not implemented, right? You see? So if I said, this is a list of functions of one argument, uh, then uh, should be complaints saying, ah, oh, wait a minute, like uh, show for functions is not implemented, therefore this cannot work, right? Uh, but if I use something for which show is implemented like int, then uh, should be is happy and then everything works fine. Okay, so let's go back to maybe. So if I have some form of a, a struct, right? So if I have R, which is um, like, no, no, I, I have um, a struct um, R, which is of some type, right? Uh, and then um, I can have a variable V, which is of, um, of type, yeah, let's do capital. So I have a struct R and I have a V of type R, but I haven't initialized it. So in C, C++ world, that would be kind of a null, right? We have a concept of something being not initialized yet, and then it's kind of a null. Um, so uh, the type uh, and, and null is sort of a, an awkward thing because it's very polymorphic in C++, right? Like anything can be null 
and then if you get a null, you don't really know what type it is, right? So if I uh, get a null from somewhere, like let's say I have a function. Um, so if I have a function func of, of f, and the function f returns uh, an instance of uh, uh, of r, and it returns a nil, then I don't know if nil, uh, null actually. Then null is kind of a very generic, like it doesn't tell you anything, like it doesn't tell you what the underlying data structure is, and it is by design. It's a very opaque, right? Same as um, same as we have like a pointer to a void, right? We don't know what that pointer points to, right? It's very opaque. Like it, you can kind of uh, have a pointer to void pointing to anything, right? So in some programming languages, uh, this concept of null and the concept of nil and the concept of default value, like the, the nil value is kind of modified such that you can carry the type information with it. And that is the case in Golang, right? So the difference, um, so now if I have um, a type, um, type R, which is a struct in Golang, um, and then I have R with R, which is just like not initialized R, then this one is, um, it is kind of a nil, but at the same time, it is sort of a, a default value for R, right? So it kind of initializes a, a, a type for me, which says this is nil, but the nil is not null because this is like the uh, just not initialized R. And the not initialized R is already an R, but not initialized yet, right? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that an empty value in Golang carries a type with it. Whereas an empty value like null value in C++ doesn't carry a type, it's null, right? And null doesn't tell you what type it is. Uh, whereas here it tells you like, it is a nil, but it's a of type R. And the type R nil has a certain construct. And let's say I, I have it uh, as a, I have a name here, which is a string, uh, small string. In Golang, that means uh, I can do I can do our name, and that will return me an empty value for name, which is an empty string, right? Um, so a non-initialized structure is already sort of pre-initialized with the default values. Uh, so the same with this, right? So if I say I have a name which is a string, but I haven't initialized it then it will be an empty string, right? Whereas in C++, if I have a string which is not initialized, it will be null. Like it will not be an empty string. Like an empty string is already a string, but null is not a string yet. Uh, so in some programming languages, we, we kind of took advantage of this type system such that we can carry additional information when something returns us a nil or null of what it was. Uh, and that is beneficial. So, um, but this is a little bit ambiguous because an empty string is kind of a nil string and it is an empty string, right? Uh, so sometimes you want to distinguish uh, things which are sort of an empty string being kind of a string which is empty and an empty string which is a string which has not been initialized yet, right? And we have this situation in Golang with uh, maps where we have um, a map of like um, key to key value pairs. And then I some like, uh, if, if I have a map between, let's say, so if I have a map between, Um, if I have a map between string and strings, then let's say I have the R, which is the, the map. And then if I say, okay, uh, give me a value for mama. And then if it returns me an empty string, 
I don't know if the if there is a record which has the key mama and it is an empty string, or if there is no entry with this particular key and that it returns me a nil, right? So this um, this thing here is ambiguous because it kind of gives me possible two interpretations. One is that there is a key mama in my mind map which maps to an empty string. The other interpretation is, well, there is no key mama and this is just nil, right? Um, so that's why we have this kind of a check um, uh, in Golang, which uh, returns two things. So like uh, I can actually check if the, um, so if, if I use it in the if statement, I can disambiguate if that thing, that empty string is the value of the key or if it is the kind of nothing, uh, like nil. So as, as we kind of, as I'm ranting about, like kind of uh, having uh, a, a concept of nothing, like uh, it's not a value, it's sort of not initialized yet. It's like doesn't exist yet but having kind of a nothing of the particular type is useful. And you see it in Haskell and you see it in Rust. So Haskell has this kind of a maybe type and the maybe type is defined um, maybe A is sort of defined as a type of nothing or just something. And this just something is kind of a parameterized as a polymorphic again. So this definition is polymorphic because we don't care of about you know a particular type, and then the interesting thing is that this nothing is actually a polymorphic type again. So if we go back to the uh, and we ask what is the type of nothing, uh, it says well uh, the type of nothing is maybe a and a is unconstrained, right? So again, it's like a placeholder for any possible um, type. It's the same as with the empty list, right? You see that it's it's kind of the same. We have A and the A is unconstrained. So nothing is an, uh, an example, is, is an instance of a maybe A type, but A is kind of uh, ambiguous, right? Because if I say, what is the type of just one? Then I will have A constrained to a number. Uh, and it says maybe A, but A is kind of a number, right? Um, I can do this. I can do with nothing. I can say it's maybe int, right? So I can, um, oops. I can coerce nothing to be an instance of the uh, maybe int, right? So now nothing is not ambiguous. It's kind of an instance of, of, of maybe int because I coerced it to maybe int. But if I don't coerce it, then it's ambiguous, right? And we use this maybe type for dealing with this case where we sometimes have a value, sometimes we don't. Uh, one example is uh, when we're doing um, reading from, a, um, so show is, it takes anything and tries to convert it to a string. And then read is the opposite. So read takes a string and tries to produce something of a, of a particular type, right? So for example, I can, so let's show what read is. So read is an instance of um, like, you can only use it for types that have read type class, right? So that means not every single type will be able to be read into that type. You, it has to be an instance of a read type class. Uh, and it takes a string and it produces that, that type. Well, it's like a lot of kind of a theory, but it's pretty straightforward. So if I say um, read, uh, read one, uh, one as a string, uh, it says, I don't know how to parse one because you didn't tell me what, what the expected A type is, right? So I have to tell it, okay. 
I want to um, read and it's supposed to be an int, right? So now read says, okay, I get it. I need to read that string um, into a class, into a type, which is an int. An int is an instance, like if we go back to what is int, um, we see an int is an instance of a read type class. So it will have a read method defined, right? So if I do this, uh, read says, okay, I got it. Uh, uh, one, I will try to parse one into an int and it gives me one, right? But what will happen if uh, there is a user error and I say one A, right? It says, oh, exception, right? I cannot parse it, right? So it throws an exception. Um, that's not useful, right? It is a user error. We got one A from a user and we not should kind of uh, throw an exception. We should kind of deal with it as an error. Right, so to to do this, we have a different uh, method which is called read maybe. Um, let's let's do this. So, what is uh, read maybe? Uh, read maybe is not in the scope, um, so we have to find it. Google. Google is our friend. So read maybe is in the base. Uh, yada, yada, yada. And it is inside text read. That's the one we need, I guess. Uh, so let's do import. No, how we do import? We have to say plus module, module plus text. What was it? Text read. Excellent. And now if I ask what is read, maybe it says, well, look. Read maybe it's almost identical to read. So I need a type A, which is an instance of a read type class. And I will take a string and I will give you maybe A if the parsing succeeded. And then I will give you nothing if the parsing failed, right? So if we do redo it for, for this, it says, so now I'm casting it to maybe int and I'm saying parse me one. And what I expect is I expect just int or if there is an error, if there is a parsing error, I expect nothing, right? So now I don't have an exception. I can deal with user errors myself. And if my parsing failed, then I get nothing. And I know this nothing. So <laughs> if I ask, what is this? Um, what is the type of this nothing? What do you think it will tell me? It's maybe int, exactly. So if I ask, what's the type of this nothing? It says, well, it's maybe int, right? Because um, we trying to parse it into maybe int, and we failed and then it returns me a nothing, but this nothing is of maybe int. So it's kind of disambiguated, right? But if I ask what is a type of nothing in general, uh, that's a different story, right? That then it's polymorphic. So this, this again, this is a very interesting uh, example of uh, something which is very polymorphic because it can be anything, right? It's not constrained like, uh, if, if you if you look at, at at this, it says maybe a, and a is not constrained by you know by by anything. All right, so that was a little bit of a de detour from the main task that we have at hand, and our main task is 
we were to define the student. So how, we, how would you define a student? So I crap. Let me. Uh, okay, so I don't want to add anything to this. Right, so we quit that and we go back to our task at hand. So we quit that as well. We go to our students. Yes, student has to, that's good. So we will code in here. And the first task is we need to define some sort of a data structures for ourselves. So we will leave the default um, uh, we will rename this for processor. Processor, processor, we will say this one is currently, ay, 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 ay. Um, this one is currently undefined. So it will compile, but it will not run. And then in our main, we say, okay, we gonna call the processor uh, and it will do what needs to be done, but we currently don't define it. And then here we need to define a student. So how would you define a student? Any suggestions? Well, the most trivial one is we would say, okay, we have a student which is defined as a function which takes a string, which is the name, surname and age, right? Would that work? That would work. And then if we define our student DB to simply be a list of students, then we basically have our basic data structures sorted, but it's a little bit ugly, right? Uh, so what is ugly? Well, um, one thing that is a little bit ugly is that, uh, so, so let's, let's do this. So I will save it. Um, I will load this. So stuck to HCI. And now I ask, um, what is a type of student? Ah, crap, I didn't export it. So let's export this. Um, we want to export the student and we want to export the student. DB. All right, so let's rerun it. Reload, and then I ask, what is a student? Oh, come on. Yeah, okay, so data constructor is not in scope. I have to say student also. And it tells me, well, a student is string, string and int. And that doesn't tell me much, right? I kind of, I don't know, like which one is name, which one is like, what's int, right? 
So it's much nicer if you tell, um, if you kind of define your own types and then you kind of use them because then you will communicate what are the certain things, right? So it's nicer if you say, I have a type which is a name and it's effectively a string. Uh, that I have a type which is a surname, which is effectively a string also. And I have a type which is an age and currently I'm modeling an age as an int, but you know, there is no, like you can kind of redefine it uh, later if you, if you need to, right? And then uh, you will define your student as name, surname and age, right? That's better. Um, so if we save that, and if we reload this stuff and I ask what is a student now, it says, oh, look, our student is name, surname, and age, right? So now I already know if I call a student, the first name is a name, so John. Uh, the second name, the second thing is a surname, which is uh, Smith. And then I have an age, let's say 12. <coughs> And let's say I do it for S and then I ask, what is S? It says, okay, S is a student. Uh, and I sort of knew this one being a surname, H, oops, and so on. But how can I get, uh, how can I get an H out of the student? Well, it would be nice if I could say, give me an H of a student. So I have a function which takes a student and returns me the age. But in this particular case, I would have to define it myself, right? So I would have to define all those functions like age, surname, and name. And that's a little bit cumbersome. So instead, we use kind of a, a record type. Um, and the record type, if I get the syntax right, is an open bracket, name uh, the type, um, and then let's do, let's try doing this. I think I got the syntax right. So surname, surname, the surname, and then the final one is h, and it's of type h, and then I close the bracket. And this one is a convenience syntactic sugar for doing what we did before, plus defining three methods, name, surname, and age. Um, and if I save it, and if I export those methods, so I would say name, surname, and age. And if I reload this, and if I create my student again, and now if I say HS, I get 12, right? So I already have a method H, which like, what is H? Well, H is, uh, um, Yeah, it's a little bit <laughs> complicated to read that thing, but it says age is a kind of a part of the definition of a student, uh, which takes the type age. Um, so what is lip age? Um, I didn't export it. So I cannot check it here because we didn't export the name, surname, and age types. So let's do that as well. So name. Name. Age. Uh, surname. Do you need to export everything from a module? No, you don't. You only need to export what you need to export. But for the sake of playing with the REPL, 
repo needs to have access to all the things that you want to play with. So that's why you kind of end up kind of exporting everything. But in fact, you don't need to export anything apart from the processor because main only calls the processor. Uh, and then everything else is kind of hidden. So you can encapsulate it and hide it. Um, but if you want to play in the repo with, with stuff, you basically need to export it. So now if I ask what's a flip H, um, it's not the type, it's the, so as you see, um, H is a primitive type and it's basically mapped to an int, right? So I cannot, um, I cannot ask what type it is because it is um, like, I cannot ask what type is of int. I can ask what it, what int is and int is a primitive type, uh, which basically says, okay, I, I am a primitive type. Same for H, H is a primitive type, but it also tells you, by the way, uh, H is defined as an int. So you know H is just like a synonym for int, right? Uh, whether you use an int or whether you use an H, um, it's almost almost doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, what matters is that um, not all ints will be ages, but all H will be ints, right? So. I can um, I can typecast uh, one to an H, um, and I can typecast one to an int, right? Okay, so we have defined our basic uh, structures. So we have a student, uh, and we have. Um, defined it using the record uh, record notation and the record notation is kind of a syntactic sugar for doing what we did originally plus defining the methods plus coercing the the types right so you will see this often uh, in haskell you will not see that often in other programming languages so uh, even though you can and even though you probably should um, so in Golang, you can redefine, you can kind of say that uh, a particular type is actually something else uh, and you can redefine it. Uh, and then you will use the, your own type uh, to, not, to kind of uh, explain that, like what we're trying to explain here is that uh, a student name is not really a string because what is a string? String is any sequence of characters that have um, uh, that have certain properties, but none of those properties is the length or the capital first letter, right? But the name will have certain constraints, and we will enforce that the name of a student is of certain length and it has certain kind of qualities, and that's what this kind of uh, represents. It represents the, like the kind of a preliminary. Uh, in uh, like indication that name and surname are different and they are different from a string. Even though here we define them as string uh, out of convenience, we know that the name and surname will have certain um, constraints that the string doesn't have. And it's the same for, the, for an H. And then uh, just uh, a student DB is a, like a very simple type redefinition which says, well, kind of an, any list of uh, students is our kind of a container, right? So we will have a container which, where we will kind of store all the students. Um, so for example, when we will have a function new, which takes this um, kind of a, sorry, uh, name, name, so name, age thing, um, we uh, will, sort of a return like okay so new probably has to take um string string and string and it will return and 
the fourth parameter is um, student DB, and it will return a new student DB, right? So we kind of, again, you can model it in different ways, but uh, this is one of the ways of modeling it. And what you will say is I have a kind of a new function which takes three things which are read from the user. Uh, and then it takes a current state of the student DB, which is like the, just the list of our students. And it, it returns the new state of this. Uh, and then if those things are correct, then it will create a new student. And if those things are incorrect, then it will kind of deal with error. So th this one doesn't deal with errors, right? We can uh, continue and then we will discuss how we can deal with errors uh, later. So I have to finish because the new, new gang is here. Uh, so let's stop here and we will continue um, with the students and I will post the code into the repository uh, and you can kind of have a look uh, how I'm doing certain things and why I'm doing certain things certain way. Okay, so I will save this. I will um, I will uh, add more logic and I will push it into the repo and then you can check check the repo. All right, any questions? If you haven't deal with maybes, uh, uh, if you haven't read the book, I encourage you to check it out. We will use we will extensively use maybe uh, and we will extensively use either. Those are two interesting types which don't exist in Golang and in Java or other programming languages, but they do exist in Haskell uh, and they do exist in Rust. Uh, so Rust is also taking advantage of those kind of types, type system for dealing with errors and for dealing with communication with the user. All right, I will finish now. So thanks.